Um, to be honest, our uh, next speaker, keynote, is an inside job. That means uh, this guy has been uh, part of the founding team of Nordic Testing Days. So, uh, welcome back, Raymond from uh, California. So good to be back here. Yeah. Asper, thank you for having us me here. So, uh, sp speaking of a good day, and actually, Raymond has a really, like, uh, in my opinion, kind of a sad story. <laughs> oh, um, because he, it's a story about how uh, a tester became a developer. <laughs> it's, the, it's, it's, the, it's the same. So, so uh, can you survive this? Is there a life after? And uh, the following questions will be answered now. A round of applause. That's an excellent segue to this uh, topic, because this is literally is going to be about that. Uh, it's going to be about a change that is complicated in a way that I don't even understand how that's supposed to work. So what I mean here is not that I go to a talk about some sort of a testing tool like Selenium, which everybody's giving the examples about here, uh, and I go back to work and I implement that, and that I can do. That's, that was not a change that I talk about here. I talk about here a change that I don't even understand that there's a problem, and if I do understand the problem, I have no idea what to do about that. This is something that I go to talk with my peers or my manager or whoever, and they say, like, as a feedback, you know, this is really not working. And I go, like, yeah, okay, get it, but I just really don't know what I'm going to do about that. So I'm going to talk about how I have come to a framework that I can't tackle those problems. And this is, um, this is my story about those things. And I also tie in there how this relates to uh, testing and developer and all of those things above. So yes, I'm Raymond Sinive, and I've been a tester for kind of a 10 years, and then now as a developer for about four years. And I've developed Android, iOS, web, and Windows, uh, most lately as a C++ developer. So that's pretty crazy uh, for four years. So let me just jump right into the solution. This is what I know how to do. This is how I would approach any testing problem. I need to find a problem, I need to find a bug, I'm testing an application, and this is how I would approach that. So I would take something that I know and I'm good at and see if I can use that for the problems that I have just no idea about. And this really starts with, like, if I'm testing an application and I notice, like, wait a minute, this is strange. I don't know yet what that is. I don't know what the details about that are, but I know that something's not right here. So this is exactly what the problems that I had, which were really, really complicated to solve, were that I did not yet notice what was it. And I'll go to examples uh, as, we, as we progress with this talk. But uh, right now, what I want for you is to understand this pattern here. Take this pattern and see how this has applied, and also see like, how it you know, relates to your uh, situations uh, that you just might have. So the noticing of, of the observation that something is wrong is so crucial uh, in situations where I had no idea what to do about them. Then I defined an idea that, you know, I want to test this, I want to solve this, I want to I do something about it. This is like a hypothesis. That this is the problem that I have. And then comes the detailing of that problem, what I'm going to do about that. And the most difficult part about that is choosing the method, because like I said, this is something that I don't know really what to do about. I don't even know very well how I'm going to define that. So I, it's really hard to go to somebody and ask for advice about it. Because most probably I've tried some of the things already. Like if I, if I say that I've now developed this thing for some time, this Java application I've developed, but I'm really not getting any better. Right? It's just this, I've hit this 
bar here and I, I, I need to get better at this? Like, what would you suggest for such a question? It's, it's really hard. Somebody would go, like, go read a tutorial. Or, you know, you should go to some uh, conference to learn about that. Oh, well, I'm done all those. And it still doesn't, like, improve me at all. So it's really something that can't go to somebody to ask for advice. This is really, really personal thing that you, you have to just kind of find. And I'll get to this. Uh, examples. So then I collect some data and prepare the thing. So this is this is kind of an easier part about it. Then I, you know, start using this new method or start doing this. And then it comes, which is also very tricky, is the validation of the result. Like, did this method work? Because in some cases, if the method completely fails, it did not mean that it didn't work. It does not mean that it didn't work. It just means I didn't get it, I misused it, or I misinterpreted the results. So, for example, like, uh, if I use the test tool, and it reproduced, if it produces me like a whole bunch of failures and just systematically failing, it doesn't mean that this test system is completely um, wrong. It's just meaning that I have wrong assertions here. I've not set up my environments correctly. There's multiple other things that are wrong about it, but it, it provides still this insight, this little details of how uh, to progress. And to recognize that from the results is also pretty tricky. So these are the three tricky parts in this. Uh, defining the real, uh, real solutions to those complicated problems. And now I'm going to jump into a completely different field. I'm going to just give examples that are not related to so much of development or testing. But they helped me to understand this. So my daughter was going to ballet for about five, six times a day, about three to four hours each time. So this is pretty extensive commitment there. So it just takes a whole time away to do anything extra. But she came to me and said, like, actually, I would like to try singing and acting. I would like to do musicals. If we couldn't find, but yeah, well, see, she also said, well, but I do not want to quit the ballet yet. Because it's such a commitment, I'm doing this, and I, I, I don't feel secure to you know, let go of that like that and just take something else. I want to have a gradual transition and make sure that, it's, that it works. So we were looking for a, ballet, a, a musical school that would match with the, the ballet school time schedule. And we didn't find any because the way that they work um, in California is that you uh, sign up for it for three months and you take like every day five days a week, and then you put on the production, and then you're done. But that didn't fit any schedule. And then we found a school that was doing for adults musicals. And that meant that it was twice a week, maybe on a weekend as well, and it was in the evening from about 7 to 10 p.m. And there was a clause there that made it interesting. If adult joins, a kid could join as well. So, I've had all my life this problem that I've completely canceled out art from my life. I have declared myself not to be able to draw, dance, or sing at all. And, but it was a huge problem to me because I wanted to do those things. But there was never an opportunity, there was never a chance. It was a problem to me, but I had no idea how to deal with that. So it was just aching inside, but, you know, and now I saw, like, wait a minute. I have this problem. Maybe this could be the solution. Let me try this method. So I immediately signed up, and it turned out they need additions. A cappella. Whew. So I uh, think, well, what would be easy song to learn? So I thought, uh, actually, my wife thought that. Uh, <laughs> so I took... Uh, uh, the Edelweiss from The Sound of Music. I think maybe that's easy. It turned out not. No, it was a really, really complicated song with a very subtle uh, changes in there. As I you know, heard it more and more, I was like, wait a minute. 
Oh, but I did not have more time, so I just went with this to audition, and I sang that a cappella. I ain't going to do that in here. Okay, don't worry about that. Uh, that just would be horrible. But I sang that to those people, and they seemed like making notes and going, mm. and I got accepted to be in the Peter Pan musical production for junior cast as chef of the pirate ship. Uh, peeling a banana is about as much as I can cook. So that was a, that was a irony there that highlighted that I actually can cook. So, and they totally accepted me there and I could just go for these months and practice this musical with my daughter and it just got better and better. And we put on, I don't four shows maybe with this and just people actually came and paid for it. And they just like, they were amazed about this. And I did not get solo parts as a singing, which is a good thing. Uh, but I did need to sing and dance at the same time. That, there was a lot, lot of things going on there. But this gave me this idea that maybe I am wrong about the things that I believed I absolutely cannot do. So they had this belief in me and in, in this environment of just complete trust. And that just opened up this other opportunities. So that started to let art into my life. And that was a just really profound moment of understanding that maybe I can do way more than I think. So another story, why I think this is so important, is that we went to see another um, ballet professional company, which means that they paid dancers. And we were in the front row and there was just kind of like a space there. And we have, uh, I have four kids. So our two-year-old boy stood up at some point and went there and started to mimic what they're doing. I ain't gonna mimic that. It's horrible. I don't still know how to do ballet. So it's weird. And then sometimes he just goes away, like, eh, this is boring. And then he goes back and starts laughing at things that are on stage. And that was kind of a funny moment. So it made me realize that most probably any, uh, any kid at that age or anybody who has been exposed enough to ballet, I guess, you know, being in a ballet school so much, is that it's a language full-fledged language that I've been completely cutting out, so it means that I don't understand some of the things that are happening. So as, as people, as I moved abroad, it, people are really saying, oh, you know so many languages, you, do, you know two languages. That's for, you know, here it doesn't really mean that much, but <laughs> it's, it's actually yet another language that gives you understanding on a different level of how body language, how movements of how facial expressions actually can be interpreted in way more ways than if a person is not exposed to this, does understand it. So I think that also opens up to way more possibilities to understand what methods work and how to also receive understanding about it. What? Okay. There's another thing that is super important from what I learned from the fact of being in a theater production, uh, what relates to work 100%, is fake it till you make it. And first time I heard that, I thought like, what do you mean? Like, should I lie that I know C++ if I don't actually know it? And just, you know, be just, oh yeah, I totally know this. I'm totally professional, I should know like this, you know? I have 15 years in career, I mean, no, no, this is not what it means. What it means is that if you drop a line, well, let's say, picture a situation that we're on stage, the production is going on, the, you know, the music is playing uh, there, and you drop a line, you drop a line, you drop a line, and now it's my line. It's my turn now to say that line. I go like, wait, oh, uh, I don't know what to do now. I freak out. I like stand there, like eyes big, going red, like now. So then... That's not the way it, it would ruin the production. It would just ruin the production. Because what I first did, I learned my line, and I learned the line before me. And that's it. It doesn't work like that. Folks drop lines all the time. And they say their lines different way. So that means that I can't rely on that. I have to learn the whole production pretty much by heart. 
and understand the whole production completely, or as like better I understand it, the better I am at this. Now, if somebody drops a line, I understand what's going on, and I yet can't help that person, because maybe they're just taking their time. I can't just steal that line immediately. So then I have to stay in character. I have to stay aware of the situation. I don't panic yet. I panic a little bit later. But, but I stay in character, and I don't lose it. And depending on what now happens, I respond to that. If that person really doesn't like get it, next person also doesn't get it, and then just things start to fall apart, I might ask a question from that person, which would remind that line. Or I might just say the line myself. It really depends on the situation. Or I could do some movement. And while the silence happens, I stay in character. I fake it that everything right now is correct. Everything is as it was supposed to be. I'm just figuring it out. I'm not yet like misunderstanding or losing it. So this is what the fake it means, is to stay still in control and to be able to figure out some solution to it. And not saying, I don't know, not giving up on the situation is what it means. And this also happens in, in work at situations where I'm asked to do some things that I don't know absolutely nothing how to do. It doesn't mean I say like, oh no, I don't know how to do that. No, 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 don't, don't give me this. I, pff, I, no, 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 no way. I say, okay, let's see what I can do about this. I go and study about it. I go and ask for help. It's not like I'm all alone in this team, especially if I can ask somebody, and usually I can, and I don't know, there's every time I can ask somebody. I've never been in a situation I can't. So then I can still continue working on this. And maybe we can come to agreement of what the timeline to, re, uh, to deliver this is. So there's multiple ways that I can proceed from this when I just don't say no. And now I've done also a second production, which was the Star Mites. It was a, a very super, super kicky uh, production about uh, a girl that just lives in a comic book fantasy world. It is amazing. It was a Broadway musical originally, failed though, but uh, it's still like pretty complicated stuff, like if they write that for, and we have live rock plans sending us. It was absolutely mind-blowingly amazing. And I got just a ton of positive feedback, even though I don't know how to sing. And they assign now solo rap parts to me. How weird is that? Uh, so their belief in me is just, just is so encouraging. And just to top that off, I've now done ballet as well. <laughs> With my daughter on the same dance where others are the completely professional ballet dancers. And I found my way to sneak in there as well. And there was 2,600 people watching nine shows that I did. So just, it just, it just, there's no limit actually. Do this. And switching a little bit to topic here, is what all of this has given me the understanding about. Is that if I'm really, really all the time in the same situation, in the same group, then most probably to a certain extent, everybody is using the same way to communicate, the same way to do things, regardless if we're doing a little bit different. It's not different enough to see something totally different way of doing things. So that really, I, I don't think, like, every, like, I don't suggest that everybody should immediately remove, like, move abroad, abroad or something like that. It's just that depends on what kind of ways you find to switch the context, to switch uh, the community that you're within. That, that just, for me, just opened up totally different understanding of what to mean means to be the other or whatnot. And that also there is really good understanding of what means to be different and what means inclusion. Inclusion doesn't mean that I'm just including people I like. It actually means I include people that I don't like as well. I mean, in a sense that if I don't understand somebody, then it then doesn't, doesn't mean that uh, anything else. It's just I don't understand them. And what cool example there was about this is like how this ballad Actually, the musical school starts their whole session. It's like everybody gathers into a circle, and then uh, 
the founder of the company comes in front and asks, actually gives actually advice for situations. If somebody comes to you and says, your role sucks, my role is way better than yours. What do you do about these situations? They give some examples of this kind of uh, behaviors that are just very disturbing. And then they provide also like, what would you say in these situations? And they say, say, for example, wow, that hurt a lot. What did you mean by that? As an example, or if you see somebody else in the situation, go step up to them and say like, wow, that must have been hurting that person. What did you mean by that when you said that? Or if you don't want to do any of this, we can come to us and we can ask this question. And then it never comes up as a problem at all because everybody knows what's going to be the outcome. It's not a problem at that point anymore. And we have there different groups of different people there together. And it actually also starts with everybody saying how they want to be called. Would they want to be called she, he, or they? And they do that as well. So that means inclusion way more than, uh, than anything else. And this also means like how extensively the communication matters. Is in difficult communication situations, like I just described, it often to me seems I lose actually the intent of the uh, communication at some point. Like if it starts to be heated communication, I'm just really, you know, just like really not getting that point at all. And I am also frustrated, I am not getting my point across at all. Then it turns into a fight, actually. And then I'm actually not about that point anymore. I'm actually about winning this. I'm actually about uh, you know, just putting that person down. And I just want to make that person feel horrible at some points, right? But that's not the point what we started off. So I, I started to notice these things as I said, like, huh, wait a minute. Am I actually on the point or not? And that's really, really subtle and happens very, very quietly. So that's super hard to catch. And this is why I said that put that in a red as well, that it, like, it's super hard to catch that subtle moment of realization that, wait a minute, maybe this is not right. Because it is followed by doubt, every case in my case. Every time in my case, it's followed by doubt that, wait, no, no, it's, it's still all right. Because this is the way I did it. This is the way it has worked for me before. So there must be nothing wrong with this. So then I just, if I notice this moment, then it just uh, depends on the situation. I just either shut up or something, whatnot, that I just don't continue with this. And I come back to this when I know the solution for this. Because I've come to realization that it's just only good can do good. There's just no other way. I can't have a conversation that is in any way having any violence or any aggression in it that it just will produce in some point a good result. That, that I've never experienced. I've experienced that I gain a short-term win, perhaps, but I've never seen that long-term work. So then I... This made me define a success for me, actually, as I've done this relocation thing and stuff, and it was my dream to relocate to um, the States, but I didn't even know why, but I just wanted to do that. And I didn't really work for this in, in very specific ways, but it just somehow came to happen. And people have asked me why you did it. I don't even know the answer. I still don't know. <laughs> so, but as this dream came true, actually, it, it would be a success, right? But it, actually, I wasn't really any way differently happy or I didn't feel any, any better because there's just so many complications to this. So this is what's really not a success, actually. And that is, was a hugely depressing moment in a sense that I achieved something that I really wanted, but it didn't provide anything that I wanted. It didn't provide any more calmness or any more happiness or any more what, what not, like that. everything, nothing of that. So then that made me realize that actually success is super calm. It's absolutely calm 
I feel way more successful if I'm absolutely calm, and I'm absolutely calm if I achieve what I intended. In a sense that I realize, I do this, huh, wait a minute, is this what I want? Is this what I intend? And then I go and do that with a really, really understood, without a doubt, and then that happens, and then it progresses, and then actually there's not really emotions to it. And that feels like kind of like feeling in a flow. That's just way more uh, comfortable, actually. And then I, then I can really say that this is a progress. This is not a kind of an end point. It's kind of continuum ongoing. So now I'm going to switch to the topics of how this, uh, I've used this in, the, in my career change from tester uh, to engineer. Because my strengths remained the same, and it was a little bit hard to actually um, see that or actually put them into a use. Because my strengths were uh, using the tools, for example. I was really good at using all sorts of testing tools, and I did not need to let go of that. I could still use really, really well the tools. I still would understand how to interpret different testing tool outputs, and I still need to do that. So therefore, if I make a change, I could really quickly understand how I can change the tests, the test is. Or if the tests are failing for a completely non-understandable reason, I could understand still what would be wrong there. I would know what to do about that. I would be just way quicker at changing these things. For example, I have a test that validates a sign out or something, and it now says I timed out. I can go in and understand, well, the application crashed actually. So therefore, it couldn't like, really like, say, tell me like, okay, this really thing happened, but it just said timeout, right? So I can still do these things way quicker because I have this um, pattern in me that I will go and check the results and just be able to find them. Also, in every situation that I worked at uh, uh, testing, I always uh, had some sort of outsourcing team that I worked with as test partners. There was, there was always, in, to certain, there was sometimes like a, there were additional testers or there was just the only testers that I had. Always, for some reason, I have had that. So now I also continue to know that very well and contribute in this way. And, and I also, all these outsourcing have been outside of different countries, for example, in India or, or in, in Ukraine or different countries. So that means different cultures that I talk with. And sometimes people say that they, they really are not getting the results they want. And I've learned from there that if I start the conversation with some sort of thing that relaxes it, and then I explain it, and then in the end, I also do something that makes everybody laugh. And that doesn't happen every time, though. But sometimes I, I'm able to do that. I'm just not a comic or something like that, but sometimes I'm able to do that. And more I do this, that removes the pressure, and more I explain the context, I get way better results. I get exactly what I want, because then they're able to, for some reason, you know, if there's no bad pressure, as I said before, you can't receive good results with the, with the bad pressure. So good people under bad pressure will do bad things. So this is why the communication so much matters, and these skills are in every tester, most probably has, has good communication skills because we really communicate with so many different uh, roles and, and people in our job. So that's really our strength. Also, many talks here and in, 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 in testers in general are really good with data. So I naturally became the guy who knows most about the telemetry, and how to use that data, how to instrument the application, that really came again. A second thing, or maybe a third, uh, that really was the great strength that I still had that I, that I used. Now, one of the other things that happened in this process was I was uh, now expected to do code reviews, day one. And I was really 
anxious about it. I was completely afraid of doing a code review because if I go to code review and I write something, you know, I don't know, like maybe this shouldn't be like this. I said things in maybe, should, in this kind of uh, ways. I was really reflecting that I'm completely unsure what I'm writing. Because this is what I was thinking, I'm just unsure. And I was avoiding them and not doing them and just really rarely going in. And I started to actually, if I started, and this became a kind of a problem. And at some point I noticed this. Wait a minute, I'm avoiding them actually. It was a huge thing to notice that I'm avoiding these things that I'm supposed to do. I'm not learning, I'm not doing anything about them. But then I just started doing them. And, an, and I noticed another thing was that I was able to find patterns in there because testers are super good at finding patterns. I was seeing like, here you implemented this telemetry method in this way, but here you implemented it in a totally different way. Why did you do that? Is there a reason for this? Or I go like, wait a minute, here is this implemented, here is this implemented again, and here is implemented again. Shouldn't be this a method of some sort or a class or whatnot? Couldn't we remove this duplication from the code? There's so many things that I could find regardless of if I knew the language that the code was written in. I could provide a very, very meaningful feedback without knowing anything, oh, knowing very little about the language, let's say so. And while doing this, code reviews, I learned a lot about how things should be written. And that is in so many ways also for me how to write the code. And also came to understand, I guess I read other people's comments, what they do expect. Now I've read them, now I understand them, and, and this has really helped me a ton in understanding how I should do this. This is not the only way to learn how to code, of course, but this is a additional way to do this. And what I want to say this about is like starting immediately to do code reviewing. And I'd actually say that test code should be code reviewed as well. Test code should be treated as a first like code, like your production code, and it should be code reviewed because like we had examples uh, given here um, earlier in the talk where they found that the test methods were long and full of assertions all the way. Like I've seen also like hundreds of lines of test code, the assertions all over the place there, asserting tons of things, and then of course they never pass, right? If, if you would have had multiple people looking at this, the chances of these just humongous test codes, I think it would be just lesser because it's just, or having other devs or everybody just review that. So not only test code writers review the test code, but everybody reviews and they would understand like, what are the good coding practices and they would be able to, you know, pass those on to, to the people if they are in a situation that there are only specific people that write test code. And I'm just gonna say that it feels really weird to cause bugs. It's just weird. I just go and I just, it just still gets like very, very anxious if I just see a bug happening out there that I actually literally caused. And that you know, still happens. I should know better, I should test my code better, but there's some biases, you know. James Bach talks about a lot of those things. So there's another thing that I'm being exposed to or just being involved with is Zero bug policy. I remember when I was just, when I, when I just tested, everything just seemed really, really uh, weird. How do we work if we remove all the, all the bugs? Because then we don't know how to track them. We lose sight of them. We don't know what kind of known problems are left in the a, in a product. Like maybe there comes a time when we can actually fix this bug that has been there in a backlog for four years. I've never seen that though. But you know, maybe. It was just kind of an anxiety to do that. But what the, really the status of the bug is, is a database value. It's just a value there. And you can change that value. What you really want to know is what we are working on, what we are actually doing what we literally are committed to doing. Because for a bug in a backlog does not improve the user experience in any way at all, or saying we will fix it, 
will not improve the user experience in any way at all. But it will do something that we need to co continuously hold on to, continuously track, continuously triage, continuously keep that backlog and, and have backlog meetings, have triage meetings, have like, and then have also like testers. I was many times asked, like, can you retest this? Maybe this is now fixed. It has been there for six months in a backlog. Maybe we have done something that fixed this. No. No, no, go and test this. Okay, I can test this for you. I tested it. No, it's still broken. Oh, bummer. You know, it's, it's, it, it, doesn't, it, it doesn't really kind of provide this value. We can change the status to be something that is not active, whatever that means, and then commit to the bugs that you actually are working on. All of them that are in there are actually the ones that you actually work on. And still, a bug fix may take a month. It could take a half an hour. It doesn't really matter like how long it does it take. It does mean that I don't have stuff that I carry like, like inventory with me all the time that I don't do anything with. And that means that if that stakeholder now knows that we literally ain't going to do anything about this, they can argue and provide additional arguments about why we should do something about this. But if we don't tell them that we ain't going to do anything about it, we're just going to keep it there. It's actually, I think, it, I think it's, it's kind of fooling or lying even to a certain extent. So that, that is really opens up a lot of time to work on something that, that really is valuable. And then customers also feel, or the, whoever the stakeholders are actually, that they're getting what we really said we're going to do. And these things, we're really, really going to actually fix them for them. And then they understand that we committed and we actually did. It's not like we committed but we actually didn't do it for years. So I think that's way more honest, and that gives this, as, a, as me as a developer, I get the sense that I actually deliver way more, because I get things done, and I don't spend time on just reviewing the same and the same and the same and the things again. Because in some situations, it happens that if the bug has been there for a very long time, changing it becomes really dangerous, because the users are used to this behavior. And if I now change that, they might be totally unhappy about it, actually. But I'm still keeping that bug in my backlog. But actually, I'm totally afraid now to change that. Because it might break totally, totally unrelated things, or the behavior is just totally going to be uh, compromised at this point. So why am I not even keeping that there? And what what instead seems to work for me way more is that if Box comes in and says, like, uh, I can't sign in, okay? Let me see, let me fix that. I fixed that. Okay, done, good, the customer's happy. And comes another one in, can't sign in. All right, let me take a look at the logs. I look at the logs, different error there, I fix it. All right, good. And then there's another one in. Can't sign in. Oh my God. So, this, and then might be in the backlog, also bugs. Can't sign in, can't sign in, can't sign in, or something like that. Just a general example. So, then what to me makes more sense is to instrument the sign in to understand what kind of errors are happening there. And then, based on those errors, see what could be done about those things and fix them prior even them raising a bug. Or if I find certain patterns that are used based on the bugs, I can fix the whole pattern. But it's really, really hard to find the pattern, what is really systematically wrong with the application based on fixing a single bug at a time. It's, uh, to me, it's been really hard to find this, what is wrong with this feature why it is so much causing us to have bugs in it if I just fix a bug at a time. 
And also, it's a little bit difficult to do, to collect all the bugs about this feature and analyze those bugs and then figure out what's wrong with there. It's, it's, you have to go maybe through each log file or whatnot. It's been the same time that I use for these things I use now for adding telemetry, figuring out telemetry, and fixing bugs based on that. And that has really been a good improvement, in my opinion, and the same kind of just systematic issues are not popping up like that. Just to summarize this up, the key points that I had about this is that change starts with noticing a problem. And what I want to reiterate about this is that is have been always, in my case, very subtle noticing. It's very quiet. It's the first thing that comes very quickly and then disappears because doubt kicks in about that understanding because it's touching something that is somewhat emotional to me, most probably. Because if I said before I couldn't dance, I couldn't sing, or I couldn't solve those problems, what I really was that I just felt actually uncomfortable about them. As you like, I actually could do theater, it turns out. Because there was nothing about that I couldn't do. It was like, I noticed that I have this problem, but I really didn't want to do anything about it. So it's really important to get over that hump. And, and doing those other things, like going to theater or something like that, proved to me that things that I believed to be completely impossible actually turned out to be possible. Like I, like I learned like a different way of understanding from, from doing these things. And then I talked about like how the communication matters in a sense that I always try to calm down the conversation because I've not seen a conversation that is difficult progress in any way that I intend unless I do that. And I needed to be that super mindful about that because I always otherwise lost it. And then I also talk about how code reviewing really, really helped me to become a way better developer. And I actually really, really feel sorry that I ever never did code reviewing for test code that, that I ever submitted. I should have done that as well. But now I just can't imagine uh, doing anything without a code review. And as final thing, I've described like how the telemetry really has helped to find the systematic problem instead of fixing one bug by one bug how that has helped really a lot in cleaning up the box backlog and just increasing the perception of quality of the product. So I think that all of these things have been possible because I took this thing, the strengths that I had, the testing mindset, so I took everything like I would find, I would want to find a bug. A thing that I don't know how to find any solution, it's just troubling me forever. I go like, wait a minute, like what would I do if I would want to find a bug? It's, I take it like a bug, like a testing exercise, because this I know how to do. And that has led me to solutions that I otherwise could not see. So I think this is why testers are, can be so, so, so successful in anything they want to do, because we have this mindset of curiosity and skills to explore and that makes us really, really good at solving problems, whatever they might be. Open up for questions. So don't go anywhere yet. Uh, we have question assurance, and then we have some stuff coming up after this session as well uh, in this very room. So stay seated, and uh, let's, uh, let's get some questions then. So maybe, 
maybe uh, let me start. So, Raymond, uh, what do you think? Is it, is it, how do you feel? Is it better to be a developer or is it better to be a tester, honestly? It's better to be an engineer. Like, I like just really solving problems. So what might there be? And I still feel definitely lean towards analyzing. Like I said, I like using the telemetry or some ways of that. I enjoy more analyzing the problems, getting to the root causes, than fixing them. So I definitely lean towards that. And I just notice when I even, when I even like code or do something with, with it, I notice problems. Wait a minute, this can't be right. And then I raise that as like something that we want to work on, and usually there is something wrong with this. So I just have this skill to notice things that when they're not right. So I still continuously test stuff, even if I'm actually doing as a coding. So I do definitely feel more comfortable there. So developer or testing? I got confused. <laughs> I think it's confusing, yeah, true. I mean, I'm not going to answer that in any, better, any, any different way. I mean, like, it's not a binary decision. Like, this is when I really be fail or pass. <laughs> you know, tester or developer. Like, you can't be both, can you? No, I think you can. Super. I think you have a very successful career of you as a politician as well, if you wish. <laughs> um, so, what's your number? <laughs> so, um, yeah. Question. Sorry. I agree, it's a very sad story, and uh, actually, the question, the question I was going to ask is very similar. So you say it's better to be an engineer. So no, why, why not an engineer in testing? So all you described, for example, the code review, and uh, a, a good developer in testing could have uh, implemented a better process and uh, have a better automation and so on. So why becoming a developer and not a better automation engineer? I guess I wanted to experiment with uh, being as a really front-end UI developer to learn very, very specifically skills about developing. So I, I think I felt like I lack the skills of coding and I want to focus on that. And now I'm focusing on that to learn really how to have good coding practices, coding patterns, and then I think I can change again to be a test tool developer, like a, like a tool craftsman. So I think I just did this for this reason, to learn this better, and then I can re-decide what else I want to continue with. Yeah, I'm asking because I see many times that uh, testers who learn how to code that move them into development. Instead of building a career in automation and being better developer, that's Actually, I totally agree with you. This is a huge problem. Like I said, that test code is never reviewed, or like I've never seen that it would be reviewed. The methods are written in a way that if developer would do this, they would go like, wait a minute, like this is, I would never write it in this way. This can't perform. This can't be reliable. It's never uh, enough uh, modulated. Like all these basic things, they never any uh, coding patterns are applied and so forth, right? So I totally agree with you that if none of this is applied, I'd, I've never seen that the test framework would work out well either. So true, this, this would actually require to teach the testers who code or coders who test to just be better at those practices and we would have way less problems with uh, testing tools. And I started to implement those things, testing tools, like unit testing the test code. I had to talk about that in 2015 here in Nordic Testing Day was about unit testing the test code as well. So I mocked out Selenium and then ran the test against mock Selenium. And then those tests ran in milliseconds compared to the way that it would just launch the whole browser and see for them, you know, go from there. So then that would just speed up a ton the test development time. And I would actually be completely uh, sure. And I've seen literally the test fail and I'm seeing literally the test pass, and now I can run it against the real application, and I would get expected result. Yeah, we have I don't also, need to experiment like that. We have also enabled uh, static code analysis, for example. Right, uh, to make exactly, sure. yes. I absolutely agree with this, that I think, you know, I've seen that the test tools have way less problems if um, these practices have applied to the testing tool code. Thanks a lot. Hi, 
I want to know what you're going to do that's going to scare you next. So you did acting, which really scared you and you didn't want to do. And then you moved to a new country, which is terrifying. Like, what's your next scary thing? I did this keynote. <laughs> <laughs> it was pretty scary. <laughs> I do I feel very comfortable here, actually, and pretty calm here. But it was, it was like, they reached out to me and, and I was like, let me think about it. Yeah, I'll do it. But it, it definitely, like, I just, yeah. Um, What's the next thing? Like, I've really, yeah, right, okay. Uh, yeah, right, that was the question. I actually don't know what I'll, oh, I, um, yeah, I po can't say Politics, that. politics. Politics. Yeah, uh, yeah, there's actually a next thing, but I can't say that. Oh. Okay, the party is here, we can, uh, yeah, yeah, well, we yeah, have uh, uh, arrangements. Yeah, there's uh, something to do with the TV. Oh, cool. So, Hi. You've shared your story about moving from tester to engineer, it was amazing. Did you see any similar journeys of developer to engineer? And how are they going on? Yes, yeah, so uh, like if everybody needs to move to engineer, it also means that developers need to change their practices. And I see way less of that, actually. I think testers are really, really doing a lot of hard work to become better coders and just be better engineers. And it takes a ton of effort to explain the test tools to somebody that's never worked with them, never needed to work with those tools. And they rarely look at the results or they, they, they rarely understand the results. I've never thought about that, actually. But I think it's a huge struggle, and I don't think it's really been motivated enough to do that. Because as I moved into this organization, I still kept you know, maintaining the testing tools. Uh, I still kept doing that, so we still have a good reasonable results. And if the results are making no sense, hmm, guess who is going to look at them? Yeah, it's me. So I think, I think I'm avoiding this change, actually, by just still keep doing this responsibility. More questions? Yeah, there is. Hi, thank you for the talk. Um, so Welcome. I've heard that also Microsoft is moving and has moved to unified engineering. So actually, do you, do you have any testers testing your code nowadays? Yes, we do. And so how that works is that I talked about outsourcing, right, briefly. So there is separate teams that are outsourced, that are used, that are doing end-to-end -end testing, for example, if needed. So you still can use that and have that uh, done, but in the team, there is nobody that is really dedicated as solely for testing tasks. Okay. That is what it means. So my next question is that inside your team, so since the so your team member, members are, I'm sure, well aware of your testing background. So do you sometimes get questions like, hey, Raimond, could you test this? You're like more suited to it, like when you're testing things yet in development. Uh, yeah, uh, only very at the beginning, very, very early, a little bit, but not later on. It was maybe just really briefly, maybe, you know, sometimes like maybe a, a month or less or something like that, really not a lot, but I did get that at the beginning. Uh, more about, I get more still questions, like I said, about the tools and how to use the tools and how to fix the tools and these things. But as a kind of like, how to test my own change that I rarely get. Or can you test this change for me? Uh, then, then it's not in a notation like, you're a tester, so you should be able to do this. It's more like in a sense that, uh, you know, can you review this? And sometimes I even check out the code, like somebody give an example here, and I just go and test this. Sometimes I do that as well, and then I find a bug there, because I go and notice this, like, wait a minute, this can't work, right? But I can't prove it from the code, so I check it out, then compile, and I run it, it's, and then I can pinpoint, like, this is not working, I feel really good about that. That I can now, as a developer, do that. I can actually check out code, 
and you know say like this ain't this ain't gonna, this ain't working. Uh, so that gave gave me this way better way because now I actually would know how to fix that as well. Uh, and now that feedback is gonna be pretty instantly turned into a fix because I've literally like proved this and and that actually has improved my testing skills in this way as well. And so so I can provide quicker actually more uh, meaningful feedback. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. So, last question. You was first. Nah. Sorry. Christian, let's Christian ask as well after, please. Uh, okay. So, you have done a lot of learning and you have uh, learned a lot of stuff that you knew pretty much nothing about music, uh, different kinds of art, coding, everything. When you know nothing about something and uh, you're trying to learn it, there's a lot of frustration involved. You try to code a simple piece of software, it doesn't just work. You try to do s some singing, it, you, you just yeah. cannot do it. Yeah. Do you have any tips based on your practices on how to deal with that mental frustration that comes along with learning these kind of new things? To put, it, put the question in another way, what does your shrink think about it? <laughs> So what I wanted to do about it, that's, uh, thank you for actually asking that. That helped me totally to answer that question. I was, I was not really like, how am I going to answer that? But you helped me answer that. Thank you, Gosper. I try to be my own shrink. What I do about this, I go and look for methods how to overcome emotional uh, stress, or emotional, uh, how to really truly let go of the emotion that is burning me out. Like, a lot of times it's said, like, just let it go. Like an Elsa movie, right? Let it go. I was like, mm, yeah, okay, that's a good idea, but, like, I don't know how to do that. Like, how do I literally, literally let it go? So then I'm, then I'm out there to search for methods that would literally teach me how I could make the change about the emotions I have. And like I talked about, the, if I have a heated conversation with somebody, like, how I calm that down first need to calm myself down, not the other person. I've, I've, I've realized that if I talk with somebody, they reflect my emotions way more than I ever thought. So I did this experimentation that I went to somebody and started to give like a good news with the bad emotions. I can now bring any emotion on myself, right? So I bought bad emotion on myself and went with the good news out. And the result was that that person got really anxious about it. And then I tried the separate way. I went with the good news, well, bad news, right? And with a good emotion. And it was like, yeah, that's cool. I go, yeah, sure, you know, we have this problem. Can you fix it? Yeah, I can fix it. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, no problem. It's like, what? So you can try to do that as well. Like, go to somebody that is very emotional. Okay, maybe not very emotional. Maybe that's not a good thing to do as a first thing, right? But, you know, <laughs> like something, something safer, right? Maybe not your manager immediately, right? You know, that might backfire, although I did it. Uh, then, and, and just give a message with a certain emotion and see, like, how that reflects back. Like, me as a tester, I wanted to, like, test these things out, right? So I tested that out. But actually, I did not really answer your question because I did not say what the method is that I'm using. I can't tell that. It's weird. Because uh, if I tell it to you, then you wouldn't find it. Like, you have to find that method. This is what I said. It's so, so, so complicated to choose the method because it's so personal what works. And, and people tend to have this bias for suggestions in a hope that it will work if it's about emotional situations. And then it, then it just can't, can't really work out. But what I can say is I go to awareness and mindful trainings a ton. And I'm pretty good at uh, yoga at this point with regards to how I control my emotions. So essentially I go to mindful and awareness trainings. Oh, oh Raymond, uh, you just missed the opportunity of selling a full day tutorial about how to manage. Yeah, right. Uh, <laughs> right. No, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm not as good yet to do a tutorial about it, but maybe someday, you know, I'm, I want to definitely get there. So you'll, would... you'll be definitely up to the task. Um, 
So thank you all for these questions. And uh, Raymond, I think you did a wonderful job. Thank, thank you, you for that. <laughs> Thank you. So in, in this bag, you, you've got a little something, you know, if uh, yoga doesn't help, then, uh, yeah, you can sleep. Yeah, you can sleep. That helps yeah, a lot, yeah. right? Sleeping is a, is a thing. With yeah. four kids, yeah, that's like, <laughs> I'm actually going to be very useful. Like, it's just blindfold myself. And I did not see what just happened right now. I'm calm about it. There you go. This is how I'm going to use this. Some uh, life advice from Ryman. He'll be around for the party. So... <laughs> So, um, thanks. No, I'm not going to go away. I have a task yeah, here. I, know, I have a purpose. I know. I know. So, you're, you're probably all very anxious what, what is going to happen next. And uh, to be honest, even I don't know that. I've been kept in dark. Not literally. Um, <laughs> but I've been told that there's going to be a little uh, art history lesson. Stuff is happening, you see. And... Uh, after this, we will have a dinner and party right, right on. So there's no skipping a beat. Yeah. And um, I, I remember that in your speech, you mentioned about that, you know, bring art to your life. Can you have a better segue yeah, then? <laughs> yeah. So, so, yeah, we have art. It's now in your life as well. And there will be other opportunities to bring art, not literally like this, in your life later on as well. So... Uh, if you're feeling a bit bored later on and you have nobody to talk to, then you can bring up Attendify and uh, think through what talks did you see today and uh, what did you like and uh, what can be improved. Your comments and reviews are very, very welcome. They will help the content team to make uh, even better conference like next year. So also during the party, during the evening, we will have... Uh, as usual, lightning talks, game room, and uh, a thing called PowerPoint karaoke. Usually, I would recommend some drinks before that. Um, it, it was, I was told it will help the uh, process a bit. And during today's event, uh, in the evening, there will be, there's a lot of action going on here. Um, there is a little game I want you all to play. So I suppose you're all wearing your uh, name tags, yeah? So the game is the following. If you see somebody whose uh, tag is like this, it is your obligation to walk over to that person, turn around the tag and get acquainted. So this is how you make new friends here. So, uh, and if you spot the tag and you have a friend next to it, you can force your friend to go there, yeah? So no, no bailing out there. So we ready? I suppose we are. Let's let's see what what the entertainment team has in uh, in for us. <laughs> 